This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Your brothers and sisters in Christ, fellow beloved ones, loved by our Savior Jesus, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Why risk everything for a fugitive? Jonathan didn't have to do it. He had plenty of reasons not to, to do so. He was the oldest son of Saul, king of Israel, which made him the rightful heir of the throne of the kingdom of Israel. That meant he was also wealthy, powerful. He was a, a mighty warrior, respected by friend and foe alike. He even had a family. He had a wife, a little boy named Mephibosheth. He had so much. He had it all. Yet he had, and he, and he had so much ahead of him, yet, yet he was willing to risk everything for a fugitive. His friend David. There was a time when David was highly favored in Saul's court. After all, David was the young man, the young shepherd. shepherd I wouldn't, know, wouldn't necessarily say he was a little boy, but he was a young, young man, young shepherd who had successfully defeated that giant Philistine named Goliath with nothing more than a sling, a stone, and a simple trust in the Lord. The Lord richly blessed him. In fact, uh, every task the king gave to David, he was so successful at it that it, pretty soon David found himself as a high-ranking general in Israel's army. He was highly favored. The enemies of Israel could not stop him. They fled from him. When, and every time he would go out to battle, his victories would become greater and greater. And pretty soon, the people, as he would come back from battle, he and King Saul and Israel's army would come back, and, and the people would come out of their houses, and they would sing, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. You can imagine how King Saul felt about that. He started to get jealous. It didn't really help that he was already paranoid, already being tormented by an evil spirit, already separated from the true God. So his jealousy got more and more intense with every victory, with every song of praise that came David's way. And that jealousy got worse and worse as it became clear that the Lord was with David. So King Saul convinced himself that the best way to go was to eliminate David somehow, some way, whatever it took. As I mentioned, Saul was tormented by an evil spirit, so David had been hired to play his harp to soothe Saul. It helped. But instead of soothing Saul, Saul used it as an opportunity to take his spear and try to make David into a human pincushion. David would always get away, but it happened several times. Saul would send David out at that to, to head up uh, suicide missions into Philistine territory, expecting, well, hey, the Philistines will take care of the young man. He won't come back. And what do you know, every time David went, not only was he successful, but his enemies fled before him. Saul even tried using marriage to his own daughter, Michal. <coughs> As a way to maybe distract David so that, so that maybe he'd die in battle because he was so distracted with life at home. But even that plan failed. The Lord just kept blessing David. The Lord was clearly with David. And yet, in all of that, David wasn't trying to eliminate Saul. He wasn't trying to... To slaughter his family. David had been anointed to be the next king of Israel. God had sent his prophet Samuel to anoint David. And a time would come when David would take over for Saul. He would become the new king. But God did not call David to eliminate Saul. To eliminate his family. In fact, David faithfully served his king until the day that Saul had died. What's also interesting is that David and Saul's oldest son, the other heir to the throne, Jonathan, formed a strong bond. They were practically brothers. They were so close, such good friends. 
The friendship of David and Jonathan is one of the one of the best examples of, of a true Christian loving friendship in all of Scripture. <clears throat> Yet Saul's jealousy knew no bounds. He kept trying to put David in danger. He kept trying to eliminate David somehow, some way, and the Lord kept blessing him. No matter how much his father hated David, however, Jonathan remained faithful to his friend. He remained the steadfast, loyal friend of, king, of the young man David. Now for a time, Jonathan had actually gotten his father, the king, to swear that he would no longer try to kill David, but you knew it was only a matter of time before Saul was heaving spears at David's head once again. And finally David said, that's enough. I'm not playing hard for you anymore. Saul's daughter, Michal, helped David escape from his home. He fled to the home of the prophet Samuel where only, if not for the, the work of the Holy Spirit, if not for the power of God, David would have never escaped from Saul and his pursuers. <coughs> David was a fugitive because of the king's jealousy. He was innocent. There was no reason for any of this to be happening to him, but that didn't matter to King Saul. He wanted David dead. You can imagine how the young man felt. <coughs> He was, he was near his wit's end. His emotions, his mental health, his spiritual health, they were just getting so terribly frayed. He didn't know what to do. And soon after his miraculous escape from Samuel's home, David, David found Jonathan, his dear friend. And the question just came blurting out, What have I done? What is my crime? How have I wronged your father that he's trying to take my life? At first, Jonathan didn't believe him. He had convinced his father, the king, to stop pursuing David. And, so, and David so wished that that would have held true. But the truth was, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, there is only one step between me and death. Where else could David go? What else could David do? He didn't know. But David's dear friend... Jonathan was not going to abandon his dear friend. They came up with a plan that would enable Jonathan to find out what Saul's intentions really were and then report them back to David, whether David could come back into the, into the king's court or whether he could escape safely. But it was going to be dangerous. Saul's temper flare-ups were well known for how deadly they were. For all Jonathan knew, his own father was going to hurl a spear at his own head, which he did. Jonathan assured his friend with an oath on the Lord's name, By the Lord, the God of Israel, I will surely sound out my father by this time, the day after tomorrow. If he is favorably disposed toward you, will I not send you word and let you know? But if my father is inclined to harm you, may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if I do not let you know and send you away safely. May the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. Jonathan's selfless, Loyal love for his dear friend David moved him into action, even though it meant risking everything for a fugitive. <coughs> Jonathan, even though he was willing to risk his life, he was actually willing to risk even more. Now what we're about to hear from Jonathan, it's not necessarily going to be very obvious, but it's definitely there. Jonathan said, But show unfailing kindness like that of the Lord as long as I live, so that I may not be killed, and do not ever cut off your kindness from my family, not even when the Lord has cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. Jonathan was the oldest son. He was the heir, at least biologically, the heir to the throne of the king of Israel. But here clearly recognizes that David, David would be the one to become king. David was the one whom God had appointed to become the king of Israel. Jonathan recognized his future king in David, and that meant that once David was in power, Jonathan was likely to lose everything. Being the oldest son of the king, under normal circumstances, anywhere else in the world, he would be a threat. He would lose his power, his wealth, his prestige, his authority, everything. In fact, he'd probably be killed. <coughs> there were 
probably be some form of a civil war. But that's not how Jonathan responds to his friend. That's not how Jonathan responds as he recognizes that David definitely was God's true appointed king. Jonathan was willing to risk it all. He was willing to risk it all because of the selfless, unfailing love that he had come to know through the Lord of free and faithful grace. It's interesting. Jonathan asks David to show to him and to his family the same love that the Lord of free and faithful grace shows to us. Jonathan knew that grace of God intimately. Not only had the Lord give him, given him everything that he had, but he also enjoyed the Lord's selfless love that would one day be embodied in the person of the Messiah, the one who would forgive all his sins, the one who gave him peace during this time when his entire life was being flipped upside down, the one who would show perfect, unfailing love for Jonathan and his family and the entire world when he would come to save the world from <laughs> sin and guilt. With that unconditional, selfless, unfailing love of the Lord in mind, Jonathan urged David to show that same selfless love. Now, if we were to go through the rest of the history there, David certainly did that for Jonathan and Jonathan's family. But little did Jonathan realize that the Lord of free and faithful grace, God's perfect selfless love in the flesh would come through the line of David. The Messiah was coming. He would come to save the world, a world full of selfish sinners. So with Christ-like self-sacrificing love, Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David. And Jonathan had David reaffirm his oath out of love for him because he loved him as he loved himself. Does your love look as selfless as theirs? let alone as selfless, selfless as Christ. Would you be willing to risk everything out of selfless love for another, a spouse, a child, a parent, a friend, a neighbor, a co-worker, an enemy? Or does your love and mine usually look selfish, asking, what's in it for me? So often my love or your love doesn't look selfless at all. Is your love always patient when you don't see things progress like you want or when others don't do what you expect? Is your love always kind to those who hurt you? Does your love ever envy those who have what you want or does it ever boast in what you have or what you have accomplished? How many records of wrongs do you have stacked up in the back of your mind? Does your love always rejoice with truth? Is it ever cowardly or worried or despairing or too quick to give up? Isn't it true that our love looks nothing like that of Christ or Jonathan? You know, how often aren't you and I quick to point out the dreadful lack of love in our world, yet we do nothing to fill that gaping hole with our own love? How often don't we lament the horrible lack of love for the unborn or the aged or for those in need, but do nothing to speak up in their defense or to help them? How often don't we bemoan the increasing number of divorces, we ongoing racial issues in our communities, but do nothing to promote God's gift of marriage for what it is. Or do you reach out with the loving, the love of Christ, the healing that is so necessary? Where is that selfless love in action that Jonathan didn't hesitate to show to his dear friend David? Where is that love that Jesus speaks of when he gives his disciples a new command to love one another? After all, if we do not show the love of Jesus, the world will not see it. If we don't show it, when and where will anyone in our world see the love of Christ? The answer is ultimately found in the cross. Actually, on the cross. And on the one who hangs on that cross. The love of the Savior who hangs on that cross because that love was for you and for me too. Selfish sinners who didn't deserve any of that. You see, it was our, as we looked at that cross, as we see that Savior hanging there, we're reminded that it was our sins of selfishness that put him there. But it was his selfless love for sinners like you and me. Unconditional, unfailing, undeserved that kept Jesus there. 
It was his selfless love that moved him to sacrifice everything, even his own life for you and me. Our sad, pathetic mimicking of Christ's love for our world is forgiven at that cross and in the empty tomb. You see, because Jesus lives, when God looks at you and me, He doesn't see selfish sinners running around and doing what they want for themselves. He doesn't see so many selfish attempts to love others, but instead He sees Christ's perfect, selfless love in His perfect sacrifice as the perfect substitute for you and me. Really, that's how we love selflessly, as Christ loved us. Not selfishly, as I so often love others. But as the Apostle John once wrote, this is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us. Isn't it breathtaking? God loved us. That's good news. Through that good news of Christ's love, the Holy Spirit works faith in your heart so you, like Jonathan and David, can personally experience the selfless, selfless love of your Savior for you. Having then experienced that unfailing selfless love, you and I will want to share that same love of Jesus with others. You can't keep that to yourself because it's a love that flows from Jesus through us to others as it flowed from God through Jonathan to David. That love of the living Christ has changed you forever. You have to share it. You can't keep it bottled up. You have to put it into action, even if it means risking something, or risking everything. Giving priority to loving others more than you love yourself. So go then. And love others as Jesus has loved you. Show them the love of Jesus. Put that love of Jesus... Love the person who rubs you the wrong way. With that love of Jesus, love the person who isn't so easy to love. With that love of Jesus, love the person who wronged you and the person sitting next to you. And go home. Go to work. Go to school. Go to family and friends. And with that same love of Jesus, love the person who perhaps may sit next to you next week. Love one another just as Christ has so selflessly loved you. My dear friends, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen.